like to, this is Kent Mormon, the chair of the um, Transportation Advisory Committee. I'd like to welcome you all to the, the June 22nd, 2020 meeting. As a reminder for agenda item questions and comments, please raise your hand. Use the raise your hand button to indicate you have a question or would like to speak. Once it is your turn, staff will unmute your microphone and call on you to speak. Please make sure you are also unmuted on your end. If you have technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the question box. Again, please use your please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions related to the agenda time, agenda items. At this time, Jacob is going to list all attendees. If for some reason you do not hear your name, please email Jacob so he so he can add your name to the record. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. If you do need to email Jacob. me, it's J. Yep, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, if folks do need to email me for any reason, J-R-I-G-E-R -E at drcon.org. Um, but I will now read off who's uh, shown is here in this call. Aaron Busto, Amanda Brimmer, Ben Pierce, Bill Saroy, Brad Calvert, Brian Weimer, Carol Buchanan, Chris Chovan, Chris Hudson, <clears throat> Danny Herman, Eileen Yazi, Emily Lindsay, George Holocaust, James Eusen, Jan Rowe, Jeff Dankenbring, Jessica Michelbust, Joanne Matson, Jordan Rudel, Julie George, Justin Begley, Karen Schneiders, Kenneth Johnstone, Lauren Pulver, Lisa Wynn, Matt Callison, Matthew Helfamp, <clears throat> Megan Davis, Melanie Triquette, Phil Greenwald, Robert Spots, Sangu Lee, Sarah Grant, Stephen Poliot, apologies if I mispronounced that, Stephen Strominger, Steve Cook, Steve Durian, Tammy Maurer, Todd Cottrell, and Tom Rice. That's Again, who I have on the list, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Do we have a quorum then? I believe we do. Okay, thank you. Um, we will now open the meeting for public comment. If you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you as we begin to speak. If you have joined by phone, please unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. Uh, Jacob, will you please unmute all participants at this time? Yes, give me just a second to do that. Okay, Mr. Chair, I believe everyone's unmuted. Okay, do we have any hands raised? Uh, I am looking, I do not see any hands raised. Okay. If no one has public comment, um, we'll move on to the May 18th, 2020 TAC meeting summary. Um, if there's um, if there's anyone that has any changes to that uh, summary that was provided in the packet, uh, would you again raise your hand and uh, Jacob will call on you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't see any hands raised. I would note um, just sort of for, for process for clarity that uh, given the work sessions that we had since the last uh, May 18th TAC meeting, those work session summaries are included in uh, item uh, number five, attachment C. Okay. Is there any um, um, corrections to those? Any hands raised, Jacob? Uh, I'm looking, I don't see any hands raised, Mr. Chair. All right, if, Jacob, if you'd uh, mute everybody again. Um, Jacob and Ron have taken over the duty. Uh, Melinda's on vacation. Um, thought that was very cavalier of Ron.
Sorry, Mr. Chair, if you can hear me, you should be able to unmute yourself. There you go. Okay. Uh, sorry. sorry about that. Um, no problem. Um, at this time. Technical amend, amendment uh, to the 2040 Vision Regional Transportation Plan. And Jacob, if you'll go ahead and, and go. Thank you. And I, oh, I okay. also ask that we wait till the entire presentation is done for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so this first item is actually about our 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, this is regarding a technical amendment that we uh, need to make to this plan. Um, I'm going to bring up a map of the project in question. Uh, Mr. Chair, can you see that map? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Thank you. So um, this came to TAC as a sort of informational briefing a meeting or two ago. Um, but just reminder of the background here. Um, again, everyone knows that we're in the middle of our 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, therefore, we were not anticipating making any further amendments to our existing adopted 2040 plan. Um, however, in coordination with um, uh, E470, Public Highway Authority, we learned that this project that you see on the screen, which is the six laning, uh, the widening of E470 main line between Quincy and I-70, um, this project is in our 2040 uh, regional transportation plan, but it's in a later air quality staging period. Uh, the project is going to open sooner than originally anticipated. So um, the amendment, as it says on the screen, is simply to uh, move this project or add this project from both the later staging period, which is 2030 to 2040, which is where it is now, um, to also add it to the 2020 to 2029 staging period. Um, so that is the entirety of the amendment. Um, because it does involve air quality conformity, uh, we did rerun air quality conformity, um, given this change in the network um, associated with this item are the air quality conformity documents uh, that demonstrate that we uh, remain within our motor vehicle emissions budgets. We passed all emissions budgets uh, for air quality conformity. Uh, we followed our kind of standard planning process on making amendments to the plan. So we had a 30 day um, public comment period. Uh, we had a public hearing in front of our board. Uh, last Wednesday evening. Um, part of the record of this amendment is any comments that we received um, as part of the 30-day uh, public review period or the public hearing process. We did receive some comments from uh, Boulder County. Uh, so those are included in the attachment to this item. Um, you can see the, the comments as documentation of what they submitted uh, and staff responses to those comments. So with that, we are asking uh, TAC to recommend approval um, of this amendment to carry it forward to really the plan as amended with this change uh, to carry it forward to RTC. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, it, just a reminder, if you do have questions, to please raise your hand and then we'll unmute you. Um, Ron, are there any questions or raised hands? Mr. Chair, it looks like we have a question from Art Griffith. Okay, Art, if you would go ahead as soon as he unmutes you. Um, I would like to make a motion to approve this amendment. Okay. It's been moved. Is there a second? Mr. Chair, Brian Weimer has his hand up. Brian, go ahead. I second it. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. And um, is there any further discussion? Again, raise your hand if there is. Mr. Chair, I'm not seeing any other hands up. Okay, thank you. Um, at this time, um, all those in, um, Jacob, if you would unmute everybody again on on the, or at least the uh, members of the TAC. Okay, they should be unmuted. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed aye. signify by saying no. And are there any abstentions? Hearing yes. There is one abstention. Could you I state your name? This is Phil Greenwald. Okay, thank you. So uh, motion passes. We'll move on to the next item. 
Uh, the next item is a uh, discussion of the project solicitation and valuation process for the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. This was the subject of the uh, two work sessions that we've had and was presented also at the May 18th meeting. Um, I would again ask that we have the entire presentation and then we will take questions. So with that, uh, Jacob, if you would, please uh, make the presentation. Along okay. with Ron, I think, is going to assist you some on this. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so thank you again. I first want to start out by thanking everyone who participated in the last several work sessions that we've had on this topic. Um, I think they've been really great conversations. We've made a lot of great progress. Um, I'm going to summarize that here today. Um, really not much new in this presentation. It's more a recap of the topics we've already been talking about in the last couple of work sessions. I think most everyone has participated. So for most folks, this will be review. Uh, but I do want to summarize what we talked about um, and what we agreed to through the last several meetings. And then as our chair indicated, uh, when I'm done with my presentation, uh, Ron will have some closing remarks and then we will open it up to uh, questions and discussion. Um, so again, we started this conversation at the May 18th meeting, uh, continued it on the June 8th uh, work session, and then again, June 15th work session, and then here again today. So uh, appreciate everyone's time and, and that level of, of time commitment and investment into this. Uh, what did we talk about in those meetings? We talked about kind of our overall planning framework, which we're calling our policy framework and desired outcomes. Uh, we talked about uh, these major investment priority project types and eligibility. Uh, we talked about a candidate project solicitation process and an evaluation process. Um, again, you've seen this before. You've seen most of these slides already, but as a reminder, this is that policy framework and desired outcomes. These are the various plans, documents, studies, and major efforts from uh, David, both the major partner agencies. Good, good. Say a quick thing. Um, Dr. Cog, uh, C.RTD, um, as well as the local governments. So this is kind of that framework that we're using um, in terms of you know, all the collective work that we've done together um, as the foundation for moving forward uh, with the 2050 MBRTP. Uh, we talked about this slide as well. Again, the main point that I would reemphasize here is that there's many ways that we express priorities in a long range transportation plan. We can do it through specific projects. We do it through project categories. Uh, we can do it through investment allocations and financial plan. We can do it through narrative content in the plan. Uh, there's probably other ways as well. So we've talked about all of these over the last couple of meetings. Regarding specific projects, what we said must be included uh, per our federal air quality conformity requirements. Uh, the roadway widenings, the major roadway capacity projects, new interchanges, uh, rapid transit fixed guideway projects, um, those, those are projects we absolutely have to include. Uh, what we're not including here is local uh, projects on local and collector roads. So again, not how they're funded, uh, but where they're located. Uh, projects on local roads, you know, collector roads, roads that are not on our regional roadway system, those projects do not appear um, individually identified in the long-range plan. Um, they do appear um, as sort of a financial uh, financial plan uh, allocation category, but they don't as, they don't appear as projects. Um, and then we also um, we also talked about for things like project categories and investment allocations um, in the financial plan. Um, that we're going to work through that together in the process that we've been talking about, which I'll summarize again in the next couple slides. Uh, we talked about several um, types of categories of projects, safety, active transportation, and others. Uh, we talked about the status of projects that are currently in the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan and how those would move forward to 2050. Um, we said that if a project is under construction, it's going to be complete. Uh, by 2021, we don't need to include it. If it's under construction or in NEPA, or if it's funded for construction uh, or NEPA in the TIP, it'll be automatically included. And then kind of, you know, everything else, projects that are um, kind of, you know, pre-NEPA, other projects in the 2040 plan, uh, locally funded projects that are in the 2040 plan that, you know, folks, project sponsors want to have compete uh, for regional funding in the plan, all of those can be submitted um, for candidate project evaluation. 
Uh, we spent a lot of time on this slide over the last few meetings, kind of talking about essentially a dual track process uh, for how we're going to step through uh, project solicitation, major project solicitation uh, and evaluation. Um, in a nutshell, we're going to do a dual track uh, where we work with both the uh, county transportation forums uh, to solicit major project priorities, uh, but also Dr. Cog really leading up to that even will work with uh, CDOT and RTD um, again on that major planning framework to identify this sort of major um, interagency priorities and then bring all those things together, uh, work through them together in terms of uh, soliciting, identifying projects, um, coming up with draft program and project investment priorities, uh, working on the financial plan and bringing that to bear, um, and then working through meetings with this, you know, with the TAC, RTC, and the board, and then arriving finally at the final project and program investment priorities. Uh, we also spent some time on this slide to emphasize sort of that dual track process, and Ron will talk more about this at the end of the presentation, but again, um, working in coordination, but working together both with the county transportation forums as well as with CDOT and RTD um, on this process. Um, again, this is just more about that interagency coordination, uh, working, you know, working with RTD and CDOT, working with our partners on one track, and then working with the county transportation forums to identify the major project priorities uh, from each of the county transportation forums. We talked about the number of candidate projects uh, that, a, that a transportation forum would, um, would be eligible to submit. Um, again, the major point here, this is not a TIP process. These are not applications for project funding. Um, these are priority, uh, sort of in, uh, investment priorities expressed as major projects. Uh, that we want to hear from each of the county transportation forums. Not a guarantee of funding in the plan, uh, but these are these are projects for evaluation. Uh, we talked about um, what um, what a potential sort of evalu solicitation evaluation would look like. Um, one of the attachments to this item is uh, the content uh, for uh, the form to give people a sense. And you know, we talked about this at the June 15th work session um, of just what are sort of the things we would ask for, what are the major evaluation criteria that we're proposing. Um, again, in a nutshell here, we're proposing to use the primary objectives uh, from the Metro Vision Plan. Uh, those are fewer in number um, than the supporting objectives that we started with. So we thought in discussion with you that that would be better to have, you know, focus a little bit on a fewer number of objectives, but provide some flexibility um, in terms of, you know, the things that we're trying to get out. The other thing that we need to include as part of this is the federally required FAST Act uh, transportation performance measures, um, and those would be part of the evaluation as well. Those would be combined with the Metro Vision objectives because in many cases there's a lot of overlap or they're very similar, um, so that when there's overlap or similarity, we would group them together uh, so that folks aren't responding to the same thing twice. Uh, evaluation process, we talked about an evaluation committee made up of the three regional agencies, Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD, as well as representatives from each of the county transportation forums. Uh, we talked about the concept of evaluating um, these candidate projects in a qualitative evaluation. I think with a little bit of flexibility there, what that could look like, but generally, you know, high, medium, low, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, yes, no, if that's appropriate, um, but again, a qualitative evaluation in this one sense, similar to what we just did for the 2020 to 2023 tip. Um, and then we talked about the, evalu the qualitative evaluation being combined uh, with the draft financial plan, uh, being combined with the dual track process, bring that all together to determine draft program and project investment priorities. Um, this is in the attachment, but again, just to show those primary Metro vision objectives um, and at least an initial sense of what that could look like in terms of the type of qualitative evaluation. And then finally, I believe this is the last slide. Um, we talked about this last week at the June 15th work session. Talking about the schedule here, we are um, asking for this to be an action item today. Um, if TAC recommends approval today, we would bring this to the Regional Transportation Committee and the board in July, um, ask for their uh, recommendation and then approval. Um, and then if we get that, uh, we would turn around and uh, we'd already be meeting with CDOT and RTD. We're actually, in, in a sense, doing that now. Um, but after we get approval on this process from the board, uh, we would turn around and reach out to the forums 
uh, begin that process of asking the county transportation forms to identify and solicit, uh, solicit excuse me, um, the um, uh, sub-regional priority candidate, evaluate, candidate projects for evaluation. We would do that work in August along with um, our continued work on the financial plan development. Um, then we get into evaluating investment priorities through August. Um, that could be a series of TAC work sessions. And then as we get to September TAC, asking TAC for endorsement um, of the fiscally constrained, 2050 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan networks to model, and then taking that to um, RTC and the board in October. Um, as we discussed last week, that is an aggressive schedule, but it is the schedule we need to keep to meet our federal deadline at the end of the day uh, to adopt the 2015 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ron for some closing remarks on this. Thank you, Jacob, appreciate that. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I think bef before I make any comments, I would um, wanna say that um, this has been a challenging um, process and um, some difficult conversations. Um, I would say to the group, for those of you that were on the call last Monday, that um, I didn't comport myself the way I normally would um, hold myself to and let some of my frustrations uh, boil over and didn't express myself as well um, and respectfully as I normally would. Um, so um, apologize publicly, particularly to Rebecca White. So I think she's not on the call, but um, regardless of our differences of, of opinion between um, agencies and staff, I think uh, certainly the way I expressed myself, express myself in that meeting wasn't the way I normally expect myself to, nor um, the way I normally think that I do. So um, wanted to get that out there. I do want to say that you know in this in these difficult discussions um, there's a natural tension I think between metropolitan planning organizations and state DOTs in the metropolitan planning um, process. Um, Dr. Cog very much values CDOT's partnership in that planning process, and um, we've heard CDOT's concerns and appreciate the opportunity today to better explain what the process is and what the process isn't that is being proposed for tax consideration. Uh, we are definitely not trying to take over CDOT directed funds, and um, we are treating the consideration uh, of process for those funds differently than the rest of the funds as evidenced by this proposal that has this dual track process, uh, the partnership between Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD, and the sub-regional um, uh, forum solicitation of candidate priorities. We do not intend to change a CDOT project list um, that's presented as a set of priorities, but this process provides for a collaborative discussion about what everyone's priorities are and may or may not cause CDOT to update their project list. Dr. Cog can't roll CDOT and CDOT can't roll Dr. Cog. That's the tension that exists in the way that the federal uh, statutes have set up the metropolitan planning process. Um, Neither the state DOT nor the MPO can, can completely get their way without collaborating with each other, and that's what this process is designed to do. Um, the Transportation Commission program CDOT directed funds to specific projects. Uh, it's certainly possible that some projects in outer years may change due to changing priorities uh, that we discussed in this process. If that happens, it's still very much the Transportation Commission responsibility to adopt their list and program funds, and it's still very much the Dr. Cog Regional Transportation Commission and board that would have to agree to put any changes into the Regional Transportation Plan or a TIP. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, I believe someone from CZOT also wanted to speak. Not sure which person. You could raise your hand and Ron or Jacob will unmute you. I'm not seeing a hand up from a CDOT staff person. Sorry, there's Jordan, you should be unmuted. I thank you. A quick audio check. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll kick things off, Ron, and um, just on behalf of Region 1 Planning, um, really appreciate the, the heartfelt words there at the end. Um, there's no doubt when we're you know having to discuss difficult, critical, uh, key visions and project priority needs uh, all across, you know, our Denver metro region area and Dr. Cog area. Um, 
tensions can can get high and um, disagreements can happen. And I just, on behalf of Region One, want to say thank you for acknowledging and um, respecting, you know, the processes that we go through with our 4P planning and stakeholder engagement in order to develop a list of priority projects. Um, thank you for acknowledging, you know, that that the goal is not to work to change our our list of um, project priorities that we work so closely with stakeholders, including you and uh, others on this call with as well. And, um, you know, we acknowledge that there's a process that comes into place in the event that we uh, occasionally do have a disagreement on, on where priorities and visions lie and um, fully respect and honor, you know, the, the process with the RTC um, engagement, with board engagement, et cetera, to help us work through um, those appropriate conversations and, and achieve the best projects that we can to, to meet all of our collective goals. And so I just uh, wanted to take a minute there to pause and uh, and thank you for working with us collaboratively. And uh, we look forward to um, look, working even more collaboratively in the future um, on the development of the 2050, uh, 2050 plan. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, was there anyone else from CDOT that was going to speak, Ron? Mr. Chair, I don't see anybody else's hand up. Um, oh, sorry. Um, Herman Stockinger just raised his hand. Okay. Herman, go ahead when you're unmuted. You should be unmuted, Herman. Okay. Um, yeah. I, thanks to thanks, Ron, for the for the words you said and and. Uh, region one, uh, appreciate that. I just want to also, um, I think there's an expectation that when we collaboratively develop our list of projects, I think they're going to fit into the into the Dr. Cog vision uh, very well. But there could be projects, there could be reasons why they why they don't. Um, I think that happens from time to time, and and I think the I think a fair process is. You know, we continue to submit those projects to Dr. Cog, and to the degree that that you know you have a a process to determine which projects fit really well into the vision and which projects don't fit as well into the vision. Vision, I think that's okay. Uh, we should be willing to to expect and accept those um, you know that kind of criteria for for analysis, and then when something gets presented to a a, a TAC or a, a board or an RTC for approval, I think Region 1 or Region 4 can defend those projects and explain why they maybe don't rank or don't, don't score as high in fulfilling the Dr. Cog uh, regional vision, but, but that they are still important. And I think we're prepared to, to do that in those rare cases where there's a, there's a project like that. And just like, uh, just like Jordan said, uh, when we come to those disagreements, then we um, discuss them collaboratively and come to conclusions on a project by project basis. Thank you, Herman. Um, with that, we will um, open it up for uh, TAC members to uh, for any discussion. Uh, Ron or Jacob, are there any hands raised? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Art Griffith has his hand raised. Okay, Art, if you would proceed. Trying to get to my unmute button. <laughs> Sorry there. Um, so if you could um, take a minute um, and just um, let Jacob or Ron go into more detail about what federal guidelines we are meeting um, that we need to meet by approving this now. Um, that was a question that I just want to make sure I understand. Um, I know it's related to the 2050 fiscally constrained plan, but what what are those in a little more detail? Thanks, Ron or yeah, sure. I'll answer yeah, that. Yeah, I'll address that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, so, are there's there's a whole host of requirements, federal requirements that we need to meet through the regional transportation plan process generally, and I won't go into all of them here. There's a very long list of federal requirements we need to meet. 
Um, but I think a few that have come up in this conversation that um, we will be meeting through this process. So let me let me back up and say, it's not a federal requirement that we formally approve the process that we're asking you to approve today. The reason we're asking you all to approve it today as an action is because we've all put a lot of work into it. We've come, I hope, to some agreements about how we're going to conduct the planning process. Uh, we feel it's important to memorialize that in terms of uh, sort of official committee action and board approval. So that itself is not a federal requirement, but the process that we've laid out, the things that we've talked about in this meeting and the past few meetings um, do address some of those federal requirements. For example, um, the types of projects that we need to include in the plan, as I mentioned earlier, we have our federal air quality conformity requirements about the regionally significant capacity projects. Um, we've talked about project evaluation and including the FAST Act um, uh, performance-based planning uh, measures. Um, that's a federal requirement. Uh, we've talked about the financial plan and just you know having that financial plan fiscally constrained, um, that whole concept, that's, a, that's actually a collection of several federal requirements around uh, the plan making process. And there are others, but, um, but I think that's an overview of the, the major types of federal requirements that we will be addressing part and parcel through this process. Does that make sense? And, and those deadlines are coming up in the fall then, Jacob? No, the, our, the deadline, the one major deadline that we have governing all of this process is that um, MPOs of, you know, which Dr. Kage is a metropolitan planning organization, which is our federal designation uh, for regional transportation planning, MPOs have to have a, what they call conforming plan, long range plan every four years. Um, and so we actually have a deadline of like June 27th or something very close to that of 2021 in which not only do we need to have the plan completed and adopted, we need to have Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Administration actually certify um, that the plan, the adopted plan meets all federal requirements. So when you work backwards from all of that, um, federal review, plan adoption, public hearing, you know, public review period process, plan development process, that's why we've laid out the schedule that's on this screen. So it's not that anything on my screen right now is a federal deadline, it's that to meet that to meet that deadline of having a conforming plan, this is the schedule that we need to be on. Well, that clarifies it because I was thinking that I saw October. I thought there was probably some deadline in November. So it's really the board needs to approve, then others weigh in, and it, it needs to be submitted next June of 21. Yeah, well, it needs to be certified by next June. We're aiming to have the plan adopted by the board in, in March or April so that the feds have time uh, to review it and certify it by June. And our, our, this is Ron, the, you know, the, the federally required list of air quality regionally significant projects that have to be included in the financial constrained plan, that, that's such a significant effort here that we need to get that done because then we have to be, we have to have time in the schedule to do all of the modeling and air quality conformity determinations and prepare the total plan, put that all together to have ready to go through the review, public comment period, and approval process by next spring. And so that modeling, I know in the past, Dr. Cog kind of looked at it twice a year. So that's like early January that you start running that modeling, right? Or oh, we need to start, we need, that, the reason that we're looking to get to um, sort of endorsement of the networks to model in October-ish of this year is so that we have, so we have time this fall and winter to do all of the modeling and the air quality conformity determinations and everything that needs to be done. Thank you. Yes, so our, just to be clear, when we do cycle amendments, the minor updates to the plan, in between these major updates, we have a little bit more flexible schedule in some senses because we already have our, our conforming plan. But when we do this major plan update, then the schedule is a little bit different because we need to meet that federal deadline. Art, does that answer your question? Yeah, that'll be my second. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Sarah Grant has her hand raised. Okay, Sarah, if you would proceed when unmuted. Thank you, Chair. This is Sarah Grant, City and County of Broomfield. Um, thank you for the presentation. And I'm sorry I missed this in a previous work session, um, but I wanted to ask a question in regards to the policy framework and the plans that are outlined there. 
Under RTD, um, they completed a first and last and mile study in 2019, um, first and last mile study strategic plan. And I'm wondering if that is to be included um, or if it was intentional to leave out or if it was an oversight. Hi, Sarah, this is Jacob. Appreciate your question. Not an oversight, uh, definitely can include it. When we put this together, we were trying to think of all the major plans and studies that each agency had done. Um, undoubtedly, we missed one or two, and that's one we may have missed. Uh, so we'll include that. The intention of this is not so much that it's only what you see on the screen and that's it. It's more sort of that example of these are the types of things that we think should form the framework. And as we work with each of the agencies, we will kind of refine that and make sure we're including the plans and studies and efforts that each agency feels is important, including that one. So thank you for that. Okay. Thank you for the clarification, Jacob. Are there any other hands raised? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, Jordan Rudel has his hand up. Okay, Jordan. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to circle back on a, on a really important point that I, I know really matters in this process for Dr. Cog with regard to um, project scoring. And I just, I just want to point out if I, if I didn't mention this um, previously, that you know we do fully um, endorse the opportunity to have um, our project lists um, scored and evaluated against all visions and needs um, and priorities and look forward to being able to have those discussions and dialogue as we we work to come to consensus and uh, in a collaborative way on on what our future project list will be so I, I don't know if I hit on that point but I see you know the importance of it in this in this framework and um, that it's a, a strongly desired outcome in this and we we fully embrace those discussions and opportunities to look at our our project lists as they uh, as they are scored in this process so thank you thank you Jordan are there any other hands raised um, I don't see any mr. chair yeah, Jordan, I see your hand up again, but I don't sure I don't I'm not sure if that's up again or uh, no. It looks like there's no other hands raised, Mr. Chair. Okay, if there's uh, no uh, other hands raised. Uh, I'd entertain a motion and a second for approval of this agenda item. Please use the raise hand icon to indicate you would like to make the motion. Are there any hands raised, Jacob or Ron? Not yet. There we go. Uh, uh, Phil Greenwald has his hand raised. Mr. Okay, Chair. Phil, if you would go ahead when unmuted. Yeah, I'd move that we move forward on the um, this evaluation process for the 2015 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Okay. It, are you, Phil, are you agreed, agreeing with the proposed motion in the um, yes, sorry. Agenda uh, right up. Okay. Yes, and for everyone's knowledge, that's moved to recommend the Regional Transportation Committee to the Regional Transportation Committee the proposed 2050 MVRTP candidate project solicitation and evaluation process and criteria documented in attachments one and two. Right. Okay. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> Is there a hand raise for a second? So, Mr. Chair, we have four hands raised. I don't know who raised their hand first, um, but let's try Deborah Basket. Okay. Deborah. Deborah, you can go ahead when you're unmuted. So I, I don't hear Deborah on here. Is she unmuted? She should be able to unmute herself. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think I got the right button. It looks there different. I had on the phone, <laughs> yeah. computer. Sorry about that. I uh, this is Deborah Basket, City of Westminster. I second the motion. Okay. Thank you, Deborah. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, is there any other discussion uh, on this item? If you would raise your hand. Uh, Mr. Chair, Art Griffith has no, he doesn't. Everyone? No, I do, I do, I do. You do. Okay, 
Go ahead, Art. All right. Um, so, you know, in the work sessions, we talked about these being major projects. And in one of the work sessions, there was a slide, and I don't know if it made it into today's packet, I um, can't remember here, where we talked about 3 million minimum. But if it's a really a major project, shouldn't that be more in the 10 to 20 million minimum range? Um, I'm not sure that when we think about a $3 million project, that makes um, a lot of my local agencies, including myself, thinking I have many projects that should be considered major based on that lower amount. And I I don't know if um, it makes sense now to clarify that as part of a motion, and I'm not a motion maker, but um, I think that could help bring clarity if we were to establish what is a minimum project? And I'm asking for discussion on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jacob or Ryan, would you like to respond first? Yeah, I'll respond first, Mr. Chair. Um, so what Art's referring to, I believe it was last week's work session on the 15th um, as part of the memo. Uh, we did have, and I, I flashed it up on the screen, I showed it on the screen. We did have um, a piece in the memo where we sort of floated that idea um, as to whether we wanted to set uh, sort of a minimum dollar amount for the major project. So first, let me back up and clarify. Again, the federally required air quality regionally significant capacity projects, there's not a debate there. We have to include those. Um, those are defined for us. We know what those are. Um, those, you know, those will be included. Um, what Art's talking about or what we talked about last week was other types of projects that we've all said that we're interested in including potentially in the plan, you know, safety projects, you know, major regional trail active transportation projects, other types of projects like that, you know, was there appetite for, you know, defining sort of a minimum dollar amount so that we could distinguish between major versus maybe minor? Um, we did talk about it briefly at last week's work session. Uh, we didn't, um, no one, you know, we didn't sort of land on a particular figure. We didn't make that part of um, part of the package today. In other words, we're not asking people to vote on, on a potential um, dollar amount. Uh, but again, for discussion, if people want to do that, that's the pleasure of the committee. I think Art's asking for some discussion. Are you on that, Art? Yes, um, just I didn't know what others thought. I mean, we're going to limit 10 projects in all of Douglas County out to 2050. I'm thinking it might be nice to know what a project size is. You know. Yeah, and our this is this is Ron. I, you know, I, I appreciate your point, and I th it is it is challenging. And no matter you know what sort of threshold we all pick, um, I guarantee you, um, a project will come up. Someone will raise, "Gee, this is this this would be a really significant and important uh, priority that ought to be able to be in the mix." And and we'll make we'll kind of meet that threshold. And and remember that you know there will be a mixture of specific projects. Uh, listed in the in the plan, um, and there will be programmatic uh, planned investments um, that we all agree to um, that will capture sort of other other investments um, opportunities uh, within those within those programmatic um, expenditures, particularly out of um, Dr. Cog directed um, funds, SDBG Metro funds, CMAC funds, and so forth. But um, you know. I, I personally, I think 10 or 20 million dollars is way too high. Um, I could be convinced that three million is a little low, but um, I, 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 from my perspective, I'd be reluctant to go above a five million dollar threshold uh, for projects because there, there are there are important uh, regionally significant sort of projects that are that are probably in that in that. And part of the reason we came up with three was just looking at the 2040 RTP list of projects across all of the sort of planned um, CDOT funded projects and regionally funded projects. And uh, there were there were a handful that were less than three. There were a few that were in the million dollar range that that felt a little low. Um, the vast majority of them are, are well above um, the $3 million threshold, but in that range. Art, did you have any follow-up? Just to uh, further clarify, that was that the total project cost as a three million minimum, or is that the kind of like the federal 
funding minimum? I believe that's project cost. Jacob might be able yeah. to. We yeah, we typically just think of it in that context of the total project cost, yes. I did see Tim Kirby's hand go up as well. Okay, Tim. Tim, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, they just <clears throat> they just unmuted me. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Mr. Chair, with your permission, not a technical question, but more of an acknowledgement and a comment. Um, as somebody that has repeatedly raised raised concerns over the last number of calls, I did want to acknowledge Ron and all the hard work that he put in in his dedication to the collaborative process. Um, no secret that we've had concerns, but Ron, I, I want you to know I, I very much appreciate your dedication to the collaborative process and taking the time to address our concerns. So didn't uh, didn't want to miss the opportunity to say thank you thank you on that front if we're going to be crit critical we're also going to be appreciative so thanks ron appreciate it thank you tim are there any other hands raised ron or jacob uh mr chair we do have a, a question in the chat box from brian weimer that i'll read okay he said right. do you do you happen to have specific dates for the call um, assuming the board approval and when project lists are due from the forums so brian good question no we don't as of yet Frankly, we wanted to get through today and see, you know, see where we're going, um, but we will map that out. Um, but our intention is that if the board approves it at their July meeting, uh, we will turn right around and, and reach out to the forums. Uh, we'll be ready to go uh, when, if and when we get that board approval. So we will map that out and we will share that with folks. All Mr. Right. Chair, this is Ron. I had seen Eileen Yazzie's hand up. I don't know if she changed her mind or if she still had a comment or a question. Okay. Do you see your hand up at the moment? And Eileen, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to kind of mention related to the, the $3 million criteria. I think it's okay to leave it that low. And I think it relates to the other evaluation criteria. Um, so that's where I think that while it does seem low for a quote major project, I still think that it's okay because we'll be able to, um, you know, collectively understand the different um, goals and metrics we're going to, you know, that this whole process will be evaluating. So if we do have, I don't even want to say a small project, but a project that fits those criteria and that is um, the smaller side of the house, I think that's still uh, an open door. So I, I do support having it that low because I know that there's say some major intersection improvement projects that could even hover around, you know, three to $5 million. Thank you, Arlene. Uh, Ron, are there any other items up or hands up for discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't see any. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, it looks like Art may still have his hand up. Okay. Art? It wasn't supposed to. I Is green mean it's up or down on my screen? I don't know. Your hand's down, Art. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Your hand is down at the moment, so <laughs> thank you. Okay. Are, are there any other hands up? I don't see any, Mr. Chair. Okay. At this this time, um, we'll take a vote. If you would unmute uh, the um, uh, TAC members, and then uh, let me know when that's um, they're unmuted. Everyone should be able to unmute themselves to vote, Mr. Chair. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Any abstentions? The uh, motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to informational briefings, and I believe Ashley Summers will be making an um, a, give us the status of the regional data acquisition projects. So, Ashley, um, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Jacob, can 
Can you offer me um, the presenter controls? Yes, I am doing that. Okay, there you go, Ashley. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. My name is Ashley Summers. I'm the project manager for regional data acquisition projects here at Dr. Cog. And I'm going to give you an update today on the major projects we're working on in case you are not aware. Uh, for some context, Dr. Cog has been uh, facilitating projects like this since 2002. Uh, we do this at the direction of our member governments and other local partners in an effort to build foundational data sets. And our role is to figure out what requirements for products are commonalities um, among our project partners and also to pull resources together and then negotiate with vendors on this group's behalf uh, to get the best price for these products. So in the end, we're, we're able to provide high quality products um, at a very reasonable cost. We have four projects either in play or in planning right now, aerial imagery, LIDAR, uh, planimetric data, and land cover data. I think you're probably all familiar with aerial imagery and perhaps these others as well, but LIDAR is elevation data. Uh, planimetric data is a delineation of specific features of the built environment done from imagery. So things like building footprints and uh, sidewalks. And land cover is a classification of the landscape. So these four uh, products are foundational data sets that can be used for a variety of applications. Uh, but here on the screen are just a few examples of how our funding partners have used the, the data so far. Things like change detection, construction site planning, asset management, and tracking urban growth. Now, these projects go on for quite some time, so this here shows a three-year um, schedule uh, just to let you know where we're at. We spent all of 2019 planning the imagery and LIDAR projects that are in play right now, and we are in the collection and processing phase of those projects at the moment. We'll continue working on LIDAR and imagery throughout the year uh, and into 2021, and then after that, uh, here in 2021, we'll begin making derivative products. So both planimetrics and uh, the land cover data sets need imagery and LIDAR as inputs uh, to, to create those products. So in case you're not familiar, I'll do a little deeper dive into each of these products, but still pretty brief. Um, our imagery covers our whole Dr. Cog region. So that's about 6,000 square miles of collection. Uh, the imagery is collected during snow free and leaf off conditions. And it's designed to help you see assets on the ground, uh, specifically for planning and asset management, things of that nature. You'll see in the urban core here in the metro area, we collect data at a three inch resolution. And then throughout the region, um, we have other resolutions as well, six inch and then 12 inch in the Eastern Plains and mountain areas. So for this project, um, we are roughly on schedule. Our spring flights were completed, which uh, spring flights are when we collect the metro area and the Eastern Plains. Uh, those were about three weeks late. And that is at the moment expected to translate to a one month delay in final deliveries. So that would change the delivery date from this coming January to February instead. Our summer flights have not yet started, uh, but they will shortly as soon as all of the snow has burned off in the mountains. We had some challenges this year in that uh, the weather did not cooperate uh, and we had some difficulty uh, getting some flight times because DIA spontaneously closed airspace during the, the time we would like to fly. So that was a, a new and unexpected challenge. But we do have mitigation strategies that we're working on and we have about six months to put those in play. So we're adding resources right now for data processing and quality control. We are streamlining some of the time consuming components of the project like custom ordering. And in addition to the imagery that we're working on right now, Dr. Cog is offering a discounted subscription to NearMap Imagery, which is a, a, a company that produces their own proprietary product um, as a stopgap in the meantime, while we're creating our own product. The LiDAR project, uh, which is elevation data, is uh, 
collected in a similar area, about 5,000 square miles, a little more of the mountain region than the imagery project. And uh, you'll see in, in blue here is a quality level two product, which is what USGS recommends. And then in Boulder, we're upgrading to quality level one at their request. Uh, USGS wrote the specifications on how LIDAR is supposed to be collected. And so we are following their guidelines with one addition. We'll be adding on one foot and two foot contours to this project because we know how valuable those have been previously to our local governments and their consultants. Now the LIDAR collection is about 40% complete. Uh, with this project, we are a little behind where we want it to be as well. Um, that is because our paperwork took longer than expected. However, uh, we're still in good shape. And the, the best part about this project is that we are working with USGS and uh, they have not only agreed to help us by managing our vendor on our behalf and doing quality control, uh, relative to the specs that they wrote, but they are also funding 40% of this $1.4 million project. So um, so we were happy to endure the delay with the paperwork. Uh, now we are underway and uh, expected to have data, new data for the metro area this time uh, next summer. Now, once we have imagery and LIDAR, we can make derivative products. And one of those derivative products is the planimetric data. Um, planimetric data can be any feature that you delineate off of aerial imagery, but the basic package that we provide as part of our projects, or at least what we've done since 2014, um, are building footprints, edge of pavement, parking lots, ramps, um, trails, and sidewalks with options to buy up. So we do not create uh, data like this for the whole region. Um, we just focus on the urbanized area in the metro area. And uh, you can see in the lightest pink on this map is the basic package, and then darker pinks are showing where additional buy-ups of other features have been added. Now, this project is proposed at this time. We won't be starting this until at the earliest, February of 2021. So we're in um, planning mode right now. And what that means is we're lining up um, potential project partners, we're seeing uh, what kind of funding we have to work with, and we're also discussing specifications, any changes or additions that we'd like to make from previous years. So if this is something that interests you, um, now is the time to, uh, to get involved in this project planning. Similarly, we are working on a land cover uh, project. This is a project that we have not done before regionally. We did a pilot project last year of about a thousand square miles just to see if this type of data product would be valuable to our users. Um, and we decided that it's, it's worth pursuing. So we're in planning mode right now. Uh, the idea is that we would create a one meter resolution land cover data set for the whole Dr. Cog region. And uh, we would classify the landscape into the nine classes shown here on the screen. Now, if you're familiar with using land cover data, um, you're probably using a, a national data set, which uh, is a 30 meter resolution. So this would be a much more detailed product um, and be able to use a, um, in a smaller area. So the status of these derivative projects is that um, we have released an RFP and a subset of potential partners have evaluated that RFP and recommended some vendors to move forward with. That allowed me to estimate the uh, project cost and to send out uh, preliminary quotes for participation to potential partners. So hopefully your organizations received um, that quote. If not, you can uh, reach out and get one from me now. The idea is that uh, back in April, you would have this quote to help go through your budget process and prepare for these projects in 2021. Now, obviously, we know that uh, there are more challenges than usual uh, with a project like this because our budgets are so uncertain. And so we're trying to think through this in a variety of ways. One is just upfront. We know we have to be flexible. Uh, I'm still moving ahead with planning these projects, but uh, it helps me to understand uh, where everyone is with their budget process and, and what, what their needs are. And we'll just be nimble and flexible as we go through the planning process. 
I am looking for new sources of funding, including state grants that might help us get through this next year in the event that we have some budgeting um, shortfalls. Uh, we're also prioritizing the planimetric data because that data has been widely used and become um, valuable to our local governments over the past few years. And uh, so I wanna make sure that that project is fully funded and then uh, secondarily work on land cover data, which is a, a new pursuit. So this presentation here and, and several other outreach efforts are, are part of um, just drumming up awareness and support for these projects to see if we can get them funded. So I won't go into these uh, too deeply, but I did wanna draw your attention to the fact that we have some featured use cases where we have worked with our users to develop some handouts that go into depth uh, about how this data can be used. Um, you can link to these through your agenda. And you'll see cases like the Mile High Flood District using LIDAR to map flood hazards, um, or users uh, using planimetric data for emergency response or to improve storm drainage, uh, and <clears throat> potentially using land cover data for conservation planning. That specific case is about um, uh, studying vegetation near the High Line Canal. And this image here on the screen is a, a, some pilot analysis done at Dr. Cog to understand where, uh, where some deficient sidewalks or skinnier sidewalks might be uh, close to the road um, to help prioritize some, uh, some projects there. So I will just end by um, thanking our 2020 partners. These 55 partners uh, threw in funding um, and guidance for our imagery and LIDAR projects. So we certainly couldn't do that without these organizations. And, and we thank them for their participation. And with, um, with that, I'm available for questions. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder, if you have questions for Ashley, please raise your hand. Jacob and Ron, do you have any hands raised? So, Mr. Chair, I see hand raised from Art Griffith. Okay. Art? Um, <clears throat> hi, Ashley. Um, yeah, so I was looking at uh, the LIDAR information, and um, one of the things Douglas County would be really interested in, I know you in your slide you said you were 40% done, and maybe you got all the stuff on the north already. That'd be great. Um, but we would really like to see the LIDAR information extended um, along I-25 and between I-25 and pick up State Highway 83 to the east. We'd like to see that all the way down to the El Paso boundary. Is that something that we can um, try to work out with you offline or um, is that ship already sailed, including financial partnering on that? Uh, that is an excellent question. Um, for this particular project, uh, that that ship has has sailed. But um, let me go back just real quick to that um, slide of yeah, the you're extent. almost this, there. You're almost to the bottom of that blue area. You just cut yeah. me off. If that could go all the way down to El Paso, the black line, that would really have been nice. So one of well. Uh, there's a little more background here, and that is that we did not pick up all of this area um, like to the south and to the east because it was recently collected in 2018 by the Water Development Board. So USGS would not match our funds um, for that area since it was so recently collected. Uh, so there should be data there to match up with what we're going to provide uh, from the 2020 snapshot. And would that all then uh, be merged into one data file once they combine them? It will not be because they'll be from two separate years, okay. but uh, okay. But we can find a way to deliver that to you in a convenient way. That would be great. Thanks so much. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Right. Chair, Steve Durian has his hand up. Okay. Steve? Uh, yes, I've got a question also about the LIDAR data. Um, so uh, just so I understand, being a non-technical expert on this issue, is LIDAR data used in the flood studies only picking up elevation data, or does it also pick up impervious surface data? Good questions. So the LIDAR is just topography. Um, the quality level two here um, 
is eight points per square meter and in the orange it's eight points per square meter so you're just getting a, a basically a, a point cloud that defines the topography so that you understand um, like how water runs for example um, the impervious surface is generated through the planimetric project so that's where we um, look at the aerial imagery and then draw and extract uh, features that we want like like impervious surface Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Steve. Um, are there any other hands raised, Jacob or Ron? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Okay. Thank you, Ashley, for your um, status update on the regional data acquisition projects. Um, next, we will run in. Or we'll, we will have our informational briefing on the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program COVID-19 impacts. And uh, Ron, I believe you're going to make that presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I do not have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, Jacob, if you could scroll down to the staff memo on this item uh, while I get started. So. Uh, for those of you that were at the May uh, TAC meeting, we were running a bit long, so I just had a, a chance to um, get started and introduce this topic um, related to COVID-19 impacts on the 2020 through 2023 Transportation Improvement Program. Um, so just to set the stage again for you all, um, you you all are acutely aware of the economic impacts from the um, uh, from COVID-19 um, and while the duration and the uh, extent of those impacts is still uncertain uh, we know that uh, state and, and local governments are feeling a financial impact resulting from reduced tax and fee revenue in addition to increased costs related to the response to COVID-19. Um, we have done some um, survey work uh, and reaching out to our local government members to um, get a better sense of how those local government financial impacts uh, could um, could have uh, impacts to currently programmed transportation improvement program projects in the in the four-year tip that was just adopted uh, last august and um, you know, part of that is the ability of local government project sponsors to provide the um, required 20% match on those projects. And um, kind of while that match can vary, our practice has been to require a minimum 20% match on federally funded projects in the TIP. Uh, the multimodal options fund allocation that was included in that TIP process did require a minimum 50% uh, match. Uh, so those are currently reflected in projects that were programmed uh, and adopted as part of the TIP. Um, the, all told, uh, there's approximately $126 million in local agency funds committed to match federal funds and another $121 million committed to match state multimodal options funds over the four years of the TIP. Um, we obviously um, know that local governments are assessing uh, their ability to um, meet those uh, commitments to um, the local match requirements on those funded projects um, because of impacts on things like um, the state gas tax and the HUTS funds that flow to city and county um, agencies, uh, local sales and use taxes, uh, rental car fees and the like, all of those all of those fees, local property taxes, uh, et cetera, that uh, local governments use to meet those match requirements. Um, I had included some information about some uh, estimates from April on um, HUTF um, uh, uh, revenues and, and allocations. Obviously, we're, there's a lag in gas tax uh, revenue receipt uh, reporting and we're, there's still some uncertainty about the full extent of those of those impacts, but um, those revenue forecasts, to my knowledge, still have not changed to date. CDOT was anticipating about a $50 million reduction in the state highway user tax fund revenues from 2020 through 2023, and then we were able to do some math 
uh, based on that estimate to calculate the commensurate HUTF revenue reductions for cities and counties that was attached to the packet. Um, and that obviously varies depending on what share of the HUTF distribution the city and county normally gets. Obviously, if that statewide, if that state estimate um, changes, then that will have an impact on the local agencies as we get more clarity on sort of the full impact of the travel reductions that were happening and reduced uh, fuel sales uh, that was occurring. So you all have that information. Um, obviously, we are um, very interested in um, keeping the available federal funds that we have over the next four years flowing as much as possible. Um, you know, we do not want to contribute to sort of a spiral downward in terms of economic impacts. So there's value to getting these dollars invested out in the economy uh, to help make up for some of the other economic impacts that are happening because of COVID-19. Uh, but there's obviously challenges associated with that. Um, and not the least of which is the ability of the local governments to meet their, mat their, um, their match uh, commitments to those projects. So we've identified a few options for consideration and want to have a conversation to start around these. Um, the first uh, it would be a, a policy amendment at Dr. Cog uh, to uh, delay uh, delay the delay policy, either waive that po delay policy or uh, extend the policy. You all are well aware that uh, because we uh, always have some deadlines to obligate federal funds, uh, that we hold project sponsors to a fairly tight timeline to make sure that they are making progress on their federally funded projects uh, so that we can obligate those funds because the downside of not obligating funds means that there are uh, federal resources available that some other project could have utilized in the meantime. And so there's a, there's a desire to, to meet those deadlines and, and move those projects forward. In this case, given that there are um, hardships. Uh, should we consider um, a, an amendment to that to that project delay policy to either waive for a period of time or extend those deadlines in, um, based on some demonstration of financial hardship impacting the ability of the local government sponsor of, those, of that project uh, to meet their deadlines? <clears throat> it does maintain a level of flexibility. Um, it responds to that dynamic local financial situation, um, although. Uh, it doesn't necessarily give us the opportunity to advance projects from future years for sponsors that would be able to take advantage of those funds um, in the near term. Uh, second option would be uh, to reprogram federal funds and allow project sponsors to request reprogramming federal or state funds to another year based on a demonstrated financial hardship uh, without triggering a project delay penalty. So if uh, a local project sponsor has a project programmed with federal funds in fiscal year 21, they realize that they are not going to have the resources available to provide the match uh, to match for that project funding in fiscal year 21. They could request that that project be delayed to a later year in the TIP. And then we would ask other project sponsors for project sponsored later uh, if they can use those funds and accelerate uh, a, a project program for later years. Um, what might be interesting about this is these two options could work together. So we, it, you know, I don't think these are mutually exclusive options. Uh, we could potentially pursue both of them. Uh, reprogram federal funds, as I said, does provide an, that opportunity to advance projects. Um, uh, it does provide somewhat uh, less flexibility to respond to local financial situation. But it, as I said, I think. I think combined with sort of the delay policy waiver or extension, these two could work in concert together. Um, the uh, third option um, that we wanted to have some discussion about um, is, and I think most of you have seen um, some uh, press release from CDOT about utilizing state toll credits uh, to make up for um, local locally committed uh, local funds to match federal dollars. And this gets a little complex. Uh, CDOT has done a good job of putting together some fact sheet information that was attached uh, to the agenda packet today. But um, in a nutshell, um, the state has 
about $800 million or so of, of toll credits available through the state. And these are based on managed lane projects that have been in operation that uh, are being uh, paid for by uh, toll revenue, um, not federal funds. And there's an opportunity, you accumulate, the state accumulates those toll credits that can be used to match uh, federal, uh, federal transportation funds. Um, they do not add cash dollars to a project, however. Uh, they can substitute for, for non-federal match um, and allow a project to be 100% federally funded, but it doesn't bring in and of itself new dollars to a project. You can't pay for paving with toll credits, uh, but you can match federal dollars with toll credits. Um, so there are two sort of components to this. One is uh, you could reduce the project scope to the amount of the awarded federal funds. So if a project had been awarded um, $100 and there were $20 of local, local dollars committed uh, to that project for a total $120 project, you could use toll credits um, to pay the $20, to count as the $20 match uh, for the $100 of federal funds. But then you have a $100 project, not a $120 project, if that makes sense. So it does relieve some financial pressure on local agencies, but it does reduce the overall investment in regional transportation projects. And it doesn't necessarily um, meet the intent of the project that was awarded federal funds in the first place. And some projects certainly uh, simply can't be scaled, right? The project costs what the project costs. And so uh, toll credits may not be a good option there. Um, the other option would be to increase the share of federal funds to the full cost of the project. So you still completely fund the scope of the project, um, but you increase the share of federal dollars going to the project and use toll credits um, to meet the, non, the required non-federal uh, match. It does still relieve the financial pressure on local agency budgets uh, while maintaining as much of the regional investment as possible. Um, but there's challenges with coming up with additional federal funds. Uh, right now, you all are aware that we have approximately $13 million of federal funds, avail total federal funds um, uh, that are, have been unprogrammed. And we had begun uh, through the TIP waitlist protocol um, a process to look at the waitlist projects uh, in the 2020 to 23 TIP um, and uh, asking local sponsors of those waitlist projects whether they could use um, their share of that $13 million uh, to move a waitlist project into the funded category. Um, if, if Dr. Cog member jurisdictions are more interested in, in, in uh, using potentially using toll credits to address their financial constraints and their ability to deliver these uh, programmed projects. Uh, the question would be, should we sort of halt the waitlist process and agree to use, uh, put, make that $13 million of federal funds that's currently unprogrammed available to add to projects for sponsors that are facing a financial hardship, uh, but could use toll credits to provide the non-federal match for projects and keep the, um, to keep the scope whole. Um, so I kind of want to put all of that out there. I know hopefully there's a fair bit of conversation, really interested in people in um, the local agency's perspectives on, um, they have a preference for this. Should we be looking at sort of uh, uh, an uh, all of the above sort of approach, and maybe that maybe all of these can be combined. Maybe there is some flexibility um, from a policy standpoint to allow some phasing of projects and reduce scope uh, for some projects to uh, be able to utilize uh, toll credits to provide the non-federal match on currently program funds, um, and uh, and sponsors would have an opportunity to ask for additional. Uh, federal funds to make up for scope um, for projects that made sense to utilize toll credits um, in addition to the delay policy waiver or extension and an opportunity to seek reprogramming of uh, federal funds. So I guess with that, 
um, high level overview, uh, I think it'd be helpful to hear from some TAC members, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ron. Um, are there any hands up, Jacob, to for comments on this or input? Yeah, so so Mr. Chair, um, Eileen Yazni had her hand up and then Art Griffith. Okay, uh, Eileen. Hi, um, thanks um, for letting me talk, Mr. Chairman. So a few questions. I think, um, thanks for this presentation. I think one of the basic questions I have is I am I am I've read the memo and this presentation has been really helpful, but I'm trying to understand what what the problem is we're trying to solve because based on um, Dr. Cog's um, questionnaire that was shipped out to everyone, um, some jurisdictions said yes they they are, they'll be having a problem on some timelines. Um, most indicated, as it said, did not indicate immediate impact on local match for TIP funded projects. So that's why, I guess, if you could almost go back to the heart of this proposal of of why we're thinking, uh, and to be fair, uh, in particular from Denver, why we're, we're considering a change in the TIP waitlist process. That's what I, I'm trying to figure out what's the problem we're trying to solve if jurisdictions not said there is a problem. Yeah, thank you, Eileen. Really? And, um, yeah, appreciate that. The that survey was sent out a a, a bit ago, and um, pr well prior to the May TAC meeting even. And I think, you know, certainly our sense that um, jurisdictions are beginning to get a better handle on sort of the financial impacts. And I think part of this was recognizing that there are going to be some local project sponsors that are impacted at the point where we're hearing from some of our local project sponsors um, already request to delay projects, um, indicating an inability to um, pro uh, meet the, the match commitment for a programmed uh, federally funded project. So um, I, I think that sur that early survey doesn't fully capture the impact and it doesn't, doesn't capture sort of that there, that there, in fact, are some local government, some local agencies that are feeling the pinch. And I, I think all we want to do is have a conversation about, you know, with some demonstration of financial hardship, you know, do we want, do we want to, um, as an agency, have have a discussion about making some options available for those local jurisdictions so that we can keep as much of the federal funds flowing as possible. Sure, I have a follow-up question to that, and I think, um, I, as you've presented the options, I think the options are are a good idea to keep moving forward. So the follow-up questions I have is, can, um, is it possible that we're actually able to see kind of the the level of impact or proposed need, or that people are saying that they do need funding? And then also is kind of related. I think these again, these are good options. But what what does a time frame look like to to move forward with that? That's where yeah, that would I think that would be helpful for it would be helpful for myself, hopefully for others. Sure, Eileen. I I don't know about the time frame. I mean, obviously we're um, you know we're a few months away from the beginning of federal fiscal year 21 and there's a number of uh, federally funded projects programmed in federal fiscal year 21. Uh, we want to make sure that um, those projects can proceed. Um, so probably sooner rather than later I think especially you know we're starting to get some inquiries since CDOT uh, issued their press release about the availability of toll credits uh, we'd hope to kind of start this conversation a little bit before that, but we ran out of time at the May meeting. Um, so, um, and, you know, and CDOT was was clear that they wanted um, within Metropolitan Planning Organizations for local, local sponsors to work through the MPO. So, you know, we ultimately need to have a conversation at least about that and how we might want to structure sort of how we evaluate requests by local government sponsors to utilize toll credits to substitute for their local match. And do we want to um, allow a consideration for reducing the scope for a project? Um, 
to take advantage of toll credits or do we want to um, also have a pot of funds available, federal funds, to be able to keep a project whole and still use toll credits? And I, I, I don't feel comfortable um, making that determination for the local government sponsors and our member agencies of Dr. Cog as a staff member. I think that's a policy decision. Okay, um, thank you for that answer. That's helpful. Um, I think as this moves forward with further discussion, um, so, well, one, I think it would be really helpful to kind of see um, as we, as as the TAC and Dr. Cog does handle like the the TIP rural aid list of projects when there's deferrals and things like that, I think it would be helpful uh, to start presenting that information of what those projects are seeing hardships and needs and that, that need for flexibility, because that's kind of what I'm hearing is that Dr. Cog provides some flexibility for our federal aid project. Because I think it would be helpful to start understanding the impact or again, that, that problem we're looking to address, how big it is, how small it is, if there's half projects that need a schedule change or if there's all of them that need um, some relief in the funding area, I think that would be helpful to start seeing that. And then I think I would, uh, the second question or another question I would ask is, what is the time frame going to see this? this agenda item again with more of a yes and a no a vote to um eileen sorry you were you were breaking up there towards the end but i think your i think your question was what's the time frame for sort of bringing the policy question forward and um i, I uh, i'm not sure I, I think it really depends on sort of the feedback we get today and um uh, having some sense um i know that um, to your first first part of your question, that Todd Cottrell is on the call. Todd, I think, has been fielding most of the questions uh, from local agency project sponsors about potential to delay projects or the need to delay projects. Um, I certainly would ask Todd to weigh in if he's there. Uh, yeah, certainly, Ron. Um, I can just run through a few of the comments that I've taken in. Again, these are not uh, a representative of every agency that's possibly reached out, but just the comments that I've heard. Um, so for example, um, some projects where um, some projects they were working on right away and the with the court systems closed down, they were slowed in that manner. Um, let's see, uh, traffic studies were delayed because of reduced volumes. Um, local match availability, so they asked to move project to an out year. Um, the, let's see what else, uh, projects might be on hold due to budget cuts. Um, a little bit more of um, a transition with the IGA statuses, um, especially as workers were shifting to home. It took a while for everyone to kind of ramp up to speed um, and with, with a change of pace, change of an office environment pace. Oh, let's see what else we have. Uh, staffing issues, budgets, budget constraints, um, some field studies were delayed. Um, again, match availability. Um, there was issues with, for example, buses that could not be delivered um, due to staff loss. Um, and again, even some with uh, some agencies had, you know, their lawyers were um, held up just due to COVID um, concerning IG, IGA or other types of reviews. So those are just some of the examples that we've heard so far. Um, I've recorded personally about 19 out of 128 um, project phases that we have looked at um, in terms of what we would look at on a yearly review for project delays. So that adds up to about 15%. I would be confident to say that there's probably even a higher percentage than that, um, just that I have not heard from.
I guess uh, I, I, I would pose a quick question to the group, I guess, to first. On the first two options, the reprogramming of federal funds and um, kind of combined with a delay policy sort of waiver or extension, you know, does it, does it make sense to um, take those two uh, policy options forward? Are people, are, are, are folks comfortable with um, allowing juris project sponsors to, to approach Dr. Cog, say, I've got this project programmed. Um, our agency is not going to be able to meet the match requirement in the year that it's programmed. We would like to be able to delay that project to a future program year, keep it funded uh, in the TIP, but delay it, and then make that program make that program availability um, uh, that those funds available for a project that's currently programmed later if that if a project sponsor can accelerate a project um, and then kind of without penalty to the to the uh, first project sponsor in terms of the of the delay um, Jacob I think you also said art had his hand up yeah, so Mr. Chair, Art does have his hand raised, but there's also two uh, comments in the chat box I'd like to read. Okay. Um, Tom Rice wrote in and said, most local agencies, would, and this was a, several minutes ago, so not directly to Ron's question just now, uh, most local agencies would benefit more with the first two options due to a reduction in revenue. I would support either one of these options, but I'm also okay if other agencies want to add the toll option. And then Eileen also commented a couple minutes ago, um, I think it would be helpful as this item moves forward, or if it's heard again at the TAC, I would request projects to put into groups based on their ask. So those are the two comments we've gotten in the chat box, and then yes, Art Griffith has had his hand raised. Art, if you would go ahead. Sure, um, thanks. Um, so I, I like Ron's where he was going with a, a maybe a potential motion um, regarding this, but I think you know, extra time is big. Um, I think that, um, you know, for various reasons, like you can't get a court date for an imminent possession or immediate possession through imminent domain. Um, I think those are real problems that I know I'm facing, but um, I think the time really helps. Um, I get a little confused on, um you know demonstrating that covid affects i think covid is is impacting everyone so um to say it's affecting one agency more than the other i don't know if, if we want to get into that um but i think everyone could demonstrate the impact of covid um i do need some clarification ron related to um this uh, toll um, credits for, you know, the examples you gave, but every one of the projects that Douglas County submitted and got approved, we were big into overmatch. So, you know, we were like on average 50% federal and 50% local. Are we going to open this up that you're going to backfill 50% local or is it capped at 20% related to the toll credits? And, and how do they prioritize that, um, the toll credits? So I don't know if we want to answer that last question first. I was wondering if the group would rather focus on what Ron was making because I think the delay thing is something I think we could all wrap our hands around. Um, this is the chair, um, Kent Mormon. I would recommend we concentrate on the first two, um, the delay policy and the reprogram first uh, before we move on. And just a reminder, this is an informational item this time, so there won't be a motion. Yeah, okay, but I, I think that we could all collaborate on that. I think that's what we should Re agree reaching with. Some consen reaching some consensus would be great. And Mr. Chair, if I could, another comment in the uh, chat box from Brian Weimer. I know the emphasis is local match, but as Todd indicated, there are other issues that justify delays as well. Correct. Exactly. Very good point. Are there any other hands raised, Jacob? 
Um, at the moment, um, Art, do you have your hand raised again or was that from before? I don't know if I'm putting it down um, or up. I'm struggling today. It's a Monday. Um, <laughs> I don't I, see any other hands. I was right? like where Ken was taking us, and I don't know if maybe without making a motion, could we see if there's a consensus to focus on those two from everyone? That would be that would be fine. Um, I think the way we'll proceed on this is if. If there's a consensus, um, if you would um, raise your hand on the box, um, that would give us a, at this time, I'd, um, that would let us know if there's a consensus. And Jacob, uh, I'll let you let me know. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Chair, I'm seeing at the moment 11 hands raised. Okay. And those that would be opposed to um, take your hands down and then um, just curious if there's those that are opposed to such a consensus. And if so, then we can have some further discussion if need be on the first two items only. Chair, I am not seeing any hands raised. Okay, so um, please uh, lower all your hands, and then um, if there's, um, it sounds like, or it look looks like we have consensus on the first two items. Uh, if you don't agree with that, I'll give you one more chance to raise your hand and make a comment. Uh, Mr. Chair, I see one hand raised. Okay. Go ahead and call on that person. Um, sure. Uh, that person is Sarah Grant. Sarah, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm in consensus with um, what's outlined for the first two, um, but as we talked about previously, um, there's other issues going on other than financial issues, the staffing issues, changing of workflow processes, um, IGA signings, and that whole system has changed as well. Um, will there be other considerations? Uh, well, as Art had mentioned, you know, I think that we can all justify reasons of how COVID has impacted um, each jurisdiction and, and the projects. I was wondering if there is any consideration for any kind of um, you know, waiver beyond just financial hardship. I think projects are st still moving forward, um, at least for our agency, I'm sure for other agencies, but um, there have been other things that have been a bit of stumbling blocks this spring. Uh, this is Ron, Sarah, th sure. yeah, thanks for trying to, I certainly have heard, and I, 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 will, I will take it as a general agreement from the group that uh, you recognize that there are a number of sort of functional impacts from COVID that have, that may have impacted a project schedule and particularly for uh, the delay, uh, the project delay sort of penalty uh, piece that um, you want to you want to be able to take into account sort of those um, process impacts. I'm certainly aware that um, design reviews um, have been slowed down in some cases because of remote work situations uh, and staffing reductions. And so I'm I'm taking the group's feedback as um, not just sort of financial impact uh, for for particularly the delay policy issue, but um, opportunity to consider reprogramming federal funds as um, kind of the the broader um, process impacts of um, the COVID nineteen situation as well as the financial impact on those two. Does that answer your question, Sarah? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So as this moves forward, Ron, you'll put in there the uh, other. Um, items um, make it a little broader as you take it forward for other informational briefings yes sir thank you all right then let's re 
return to the backfield local match with toll credits. Um, Ron, you were suggesting we talk about this separately. I think the first question um, I would ask the TAC members is, do you need further discussion on clarification of how a toll credit works? And if so, raise your hand. Am I allowed to raise my hand? <laughs> I, I wish I was going to have you answer the question, <laughs> but maybe Tim or somebody else from CDOT can answer that. Mr. Chair, uh, seeing a couple hands raised, let's start with Carol Buchanan from Dr. Mack. Okay, Carol. I thought they were going to provide a more detailed explanation of the toll credits. I'm, that's why I raised my hand. Okay, thanks, Carol. So I'll do um, I'll, I'll 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 do my best, and certainly would welcome anywhere from CDOT weighing in. I, you were uh, the state of Colorado doesn't have a doesn't have an extensive history of using toll credits. Um, some some states use them very extensively. Um, some states uh, basically plan to use them at the beginning of decisions to program federal funds to projects. Uh, so this is a little different than that situation where federal funds have already been programmed uh, to specific projects and, and specific scopes. So I just need to remind everyone for the competitive programming of Dr. Cog directed federal funds, SDPG Metro funds and CMEC funds in the, in the metropolitan area um, that we award we award funds uh, to deliver a specific project scope, um, and so the the expectation that we all mutually have of each other is that the project sponsor will deliver that scope for the federal funds that were awarded to the project. Um, I think part of this 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 conversation then comes from the issue of some local jurisdictions are being um, uh, challenged very significantly by. Uh, reduced uh, revenues that uh, may may uh, or are impacting uh, their ability to meet the non-federal match uh, contribution towards a project that's been awarded federal funds. And so right now, absent toll credits as an option to increase the federal share of a project, um, their option is to ask Dr. Cog to delay their project or flat out tell Dr. Cog that they're not gonna be able to deliver the project and basically not utilize those federal funds at all. Um, toll credits does provide an opportunity to um, increase the federal share of a project. So um, as I mentioned in the memo in the Dr. Cog region in Colorado, the minimum non-federal share for uh, federal transportation dollars is 17.21%. Um, as a matter of course, uh, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is to make math easy, uh, Dr. Cog's policy is to require a 20% local match for federal transportation dollars when we're um, soliciting applications uh, to award uh, Dr. Cog directed uh, federal funds in the TIP. So, um, through toll credits accumulate to the state. Um, uh, as I said, there's about 800 million available statewide. I believe that there's a portion that CDOT intends to sort of utilize. Can't remember, it's it's less than a hundred million dollars, I believe. Um, uh, and but CDOT is is offering to local agency sponsors of federally funded projects the opportunity to request the utilization of toll credits in order to meet the non-federal uh, match requirement. Um, there are, so for projects uh, selected through the MPO process, in this case, Dr. Cog, uh, CDOT is directing those local government sponsors to the MPO uh, to request the ability to do that. Um, and we would, we would work uh, then to screen those and submit those to CDOT. So, you know, there are sponsors out there that are that are thinking about uh, whether this makes sense for them. And um, we need to have some policy discussion at Dr. Cog about how we're going to entertain those requests from local government sponsors uh, and what we'll do with them. 
um, as this as this uh, fact sheet says, there are two scenarios uh, for toll credits to assist the local government. If the scope of the project can be reduced, the project can proceed with no local match and 100% federal funding. So a $100,000 project is reduced in scope to $80,000 and eliminate the match element. That's assuming that there's a 20% match. As Art said, there's many uh, projects in the TIP um, that the local sponsor has committed well above 20% local match. So if if an agency has committed 50% non-federal match to a federally funded project, that means you'd have to reduce that scope by half um, in order to fully use toll credits and completely uh, completely eliminate the, the sort of cash local non-federal match to the project. Now, maybe there's an option where Douglas County has committed 50% uh, local funds to the project, so it's uh, split 50-50 federal and local funds. And Douglas County says, you know what, we just we can't meet that commitment. But if we could reduce our local cash match uh, by half and have it 20% or 25% um, local funds, doc, or, uh, Douglas County funds instead of 50% uh, of the total project costs. Then you're only you're reducing the project scope by 25%, and you're still reducing the you're still reducing the local cash match to the project. But again, all of those scenarios require uh, an agreement to reduce the scope of the project that was originally awarded. And I, I want to remind you back to back to when when the Dr. Cog Board awards federal funds to a project in the TIP. The award is for a specific project and a specific, a specific scope of that project. And so it is a policy decision of the board to decide if they want to allow a local government to reduce the scope of the work for that previously awarded project. And so that's question A. And then question B is, does the remainder of that project go on the wait list? Or does the remainder of that project go away altogether? And that project sponsor would have to apply in a future tip cycle to get funding for the remainder of the project. These are these are not easy policy decisions. I want to make that really clear, which is why we want to start this conversation. So that's scenario one. The second scenario is if additional federal funding can be identified uh, for that programmed project within the TIP, the project could proceed with no local match and 100% federal funding um, if those additional federal funds were allocated to the project because you need real cash to build these projects. Uh, you can't build a project with toll credits. Um, a contractor is not going to take payment from toll credits. Um, so in this scenario, um, a hundred thousand dollar project is kept at a hundred thousand dollars by basically procuring another twenty thousand dollars of federal funds, um, and then you use toll credits to basically make it a hundred percent federally funded. You're delivering the entirety of the originally anticipated scope of work, um, but you're allocating more federal funds. And the and the question for you all and for Dr. Cog is, where would those additional federal funds come from? And I mentioned that right now, uh, Dr. Cog has about $13 million of unprogrammed federal funds. So a policy question for the Dr. Cog board and RTC would be, do we want to, instead of allocating those $13 million of funds to waitlist projects um, in the current TIP, would you rather um, forgo the waitlist process and make this $13 million available for local project sponsors to use to backfill their local commitment to, to non-federal match in order to be able to use toll credits to make, make that project 100% federally funded? And I know there, there's a couple of work there's a couple of worksheets on the next page I think Jacob that sort of show that um, I hope that helped uh, I fully acknowledge that could have more could have confused things even more okay. so Mr. So Chair so, we do yes. sorry we do have a couple of comments in the chat box and then um, Art has also had his hand raised so if I if I can read the comments. Yes. They're both from Brian Weimer. Um, they've been in the chat box for a few minutes. Um, unusual times and situations require us to be flexible and nimble 
to deal with the situation and therefore looking at waiving delay criteria is warranted in my opinion. He also says with regard to toll credits, can there be a mixture of toll credit, local match, reduced amount, and federal to keep the project at the same amount as in the TIP without a reduction in project scope? And then actually, Mr. Chair, sorry, there's a few more comments in the chat box. Um, then Brian says, I think my second question, the one I just read was answered. Um, and then Eileen said, I would like to see the need for financial relief to, to understand the larger small problem jurisdictions are facing before we decide on shifting the TIP policy. I think that's all the uh, comments or questions in the in the question box, and then Art Griffith has had his hand raised, Mr. Chair. Okay, Art. Yeah, thanks. I, this question might go to CDOT. Um, and I've understood that there's this potential eight hundred million dollars of toll credits. Um, wouldn't we need to know how much CDOT would make available to all the MPOs? I know there's four of them, and I know that we represent maybe 50% of population-wise of the four MPOs. So then we could know how much money could go to Dr. Cog to help those who are all experiencing this COVID that we could use to apply for these, these toll credits across the board. And then, of course, we looked at our um two-phase tip funding we had like you know 20 percent go regional 80 percent sub-regional so assuming that everybody's going to want some covid relief and can demonstrate the need for covid release relief do you see one of the scenarios for how this might be allocated would flow down to the sub-regional allocations and this is assuming that within each of those subregions, maybe all or at least some would want to take advantage of whatever amount CDOT's passing through in the form of real money, although it's not money, but it, you're right, we have to pay the contractor with something besides toll credits. So I guess my first part of my question is to CDOT, of the 800 million toll credits, how much of that money would be available for this tip cycle to help out? So I'm, I'm going to, I am going to ha hand off to Tim Kirby. I think he's still on the line, but our, first of all, I, I do want to say that um, I don't anticipate at this point that, you know, kind of the utilization of toll credits necessarily would be um, assessed at the regional and sub-regional level. We've got, to, we've got to look at the TIP and we're trying to keep the federal funds that have been awarded in the TIP um, uh, going forward. Um, TIP dollars, uh, we use the sub-regional forum targets to set targets uh, for uh, uh, investments of those dollars, um, but the tip, is, the tip is a regional TIP. And I think uh, my preference would be we look at sort of toll credits on an as needed basis for the entirety of the TIP, not sort of by, by sub-region. And then um, with that, I'd be happy to have Tim chime in. Um, Tim, Tim, you should be able to unmute yourself. Go yeah, ahead, I'm here, Ron. Tim. So thank you, Mr. Chair. So Ron, great, great job uh, demonstrating mastery over the concept of toll credits. It's somebody that understands it. I fully understand what you're saying, um, but it is a difficult concept to master, right? And so I think one of the things that, that Ron said that I would just reiterate before I get to Art's question and one of the questions that I heard on the chat line um, is, is that toll credits are not new money. So the way Ron described it, we can't pay a contractor in, in toll credits, he's 100% correct. So it's just, it's a tool to leverage, you know, existing federal funds that you have. And so, so that's a key point to understand, right? So it's either reduce scope or find a new funding source, new federal funding source to leverage and use toll credits against, which the 13 million that Ron's brought into question, that's the policy question, right? So fully, fully agree with that. Art, to your question, I think, you know, as a department, we haven't put a cap on any MPO statewide. I think what we've said is we're here to help. I, I don't think we anticipate 
that full $800 million being leveraged. So we didn't artificially cap any particular area. So as requests come to us, we're gonna field those and, and, and we're gonna make sure that, that we're here to help and, and provide those total credits to deliver projects. Um, so I wanna answer that question really directly. I think there was another question that came through on the text line, which is, hey, if you have a 20% federal match, do you have to do you have to use toll credits to fulfill that full 20% or could you say do you know 10% local and then fulfill the, you know the remainder with a 10% scope reduction or new federal funds and the answer to that question is absolutely yes now i would leave i would leave it as a policy decision to to ron and the dr cog you know board process to determine as to whether or not they want to allow that to happen but is it possible and is it technically feasible and the answer to that question is absolutely yes so I'll stop there, Ron, if there's anything else you want me to speak to, or Mr. Chair, anything else you want me to speak to, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, thank, thank you. Tim. Appreciate that. Are there any other hands up? Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, we have a hand raised from Alex Hyde Wright in Boulder County. Alex, if you'd go ahead, we're unmuted. All right, Mr. Mr. Chair, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, this is Alex Hyde with Boulder County. Um, I just had a quick question for Ron, maybe CDOT as well, is I'm wondering, is there a downside to using toll credits aside from the fact that it's not new money and you either need to identify other money or um, reduce scope? But I'm wondering, is is there, I guess my question is, you know, in, in the past, maybe more some of our smaller jurisdictions have struggled to come up with a local match. So I'm kind of wondering, is there a good reason why we haven't ever looked at toll credits in the past and why now? And is there is there a catch or is there is there a downside to using them? Um, happy to, happy to let Tim weigh in. I'm not aware of a this is Ron. I'm not I'm not aware of a big downside. There's there's some administrative burden, um, which is, uh, you know, and I will say that there are many states around the country that have a much larger pot of toll credits than Colorado does. Colorado's relatively new to the toll game and toll credits. And um, in the grand scheme of things, compared to some other states around the country, $800 million of available toll credits is not uh, nearly as much as, as some other states have available. And some other states have just been uh, much more adept uh, and have a longer track record of using them. And, and like I said, I think there's some, there's some administrative down, uh, downside of sort of having to track them and how they're used and the projects from which the toll credits sort of were generated. And I don't know if you have other um, things you wanna to add to that, Tim. Yeah, no, Ron, yeah, good thoughts. You know, I think the only, if I had to answer that question, I would say as a department, as CDOT, we don't see any perceived downsides to it. I think our strategy has always historically been, you know, preserve state funds and, and you know, in the context of local governments, preserve local funds knowing that they are the most flexible. Toll credits allow us to leverage and use federal dollars to make sure that our most flexible dollars are available for our use. So we encourage it and we have encouraged it. I think you could say, well, CDOT, if you encourage it, why haven't you been using more of it? And I think the answer to that question is, is that it's a fairly, you know, at least on the face of it, a fairly complex um, tactical financial tool to be using, not well known. Yeah. Um, but, but I think we feel we feel pretty strongly that once once people build familiarity with it, understand the financial mechanism, they'll real you know you all will realize and we'll all realize that it is something we can use tactically. It's not it's not it's not you know kind of that you know that that kind of easy button. It's not it's not a magic pill, but it, it can help us achieve our goals if we use it correctly tactically. So I'll I'll stop there, and then and then Ron, you let me know if you want me to follow up on anything. No, fair points. Yeah, that's good. Um, Jacob, are there any other hands up? Uh, Mr. Chair, the only hands I see are from Alex Hyde-Wright and Art Griffith. Alex put his hand down and so did Art. So at the moment, I don't see any other hands raised. All right. Um, Ron, what type of um, direction are you looking for on this item? Yeah, I think, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. This this has been really helpful to me um, and our and our team. I, I really just wanted to have the conversation and hear some input from TAC members. Um, we will we'll get our heads together. We'll kind of consider what we've heard and put some put some thoughts together. Um, try to bring something forward. I I think I would like to uh, start sort of like we did uh, here today with TAC 
probably a discussion item at RTC and maybe the board um, at their at their um, July meetings, just so they're aware of the conversations and I can share the input that we've received from TAC and get some get some guidance uh, from the policy bodies about um, how they want to bring those policy considerations forward. And obviously, we will we will come back to TAC with any policy. A decision uh, to advise RTC and the board before we before we take a decision item to those committees. Okay, so your next step will be RTC and the board for just some policy discussion. Yeah, I think at least RTC to start, and I'll we'll we'll talk about whether that makes sense to go to the board uh, at their July meeting as well. But I think those are logical next steps. Okay, thank Mr. you, Mr. Chair. I see I, that Art Griffith has his hand up. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, so, Ron, I would encourage us to go to the board because, you know, it was probably a week in that or maybe two Fridays ago where CDOT sent this out about the the toll credits. And so I've been asked. So I think uh, having both you and CDOT available to explain to the board um, whenever they meet next, the work session, I assume you have a work session coming up. I think that would be prudent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Art. Uh, we'll consider that. I think the the July first work session is full, but um, very much appreciate your your feedback on taking this to the July board meeting for a for a information discussion. Right? That that I tend to agree with you. I just want to leave myself a little latitude to have some internal conversations before I fully commit. Okay, thank you, uh, Jacob. Mr. Chair, yeah. yeah couple, um, actually now three uh, questions in the question box. Uh, okay. Sarah Grant, just, just to clarify, this would be a tool for 2021 to 2023 projects. Eileen Yazi, I would encourage Dr. Cog's staff to put some actuals, what the problem is, how many projects, what the fiscal and timing impacts are to the board. And then Eileen also says, I think that this would be helpful when considering policy implications. I, okay. All good points. Thank you. Are there any other Ron, comments? could you? Yes, sorry. Yeah, uh, Ron, could I you? Say, yeah, I think those are those are all good points. I appreciate the feedback. I think that's um, helpful. Uh, specific to Sarah's question, um, in terms of the toll credits, I think you know it, probably tougher for projects programmed in fiscal year 20, but um, still possible. So. You know, I think we're looking at the full four-year tip, but the problems are probably more. Hopefully, projects programmed in fiscal year 20 are are sort of well enough away that maybe there's some flexibility around delay policy, but not a need to sort of fully backfill uh, local match because those projects should be well enough underway that we can focus on sort of the last three years of the tip. Um, but considering Eileen's uh, astute comments, we'll we'll have more information. Uh, to inform the conversation as we as we move forward. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Jacob, are there any additional hands up or comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't see any hands raised and not seeing any additional comments or questions. Okay. Thank you, Ron, for your presentation and thank you for the input on this on this briefing from from the TAC members. At this time, um, we'll have a urban arterials update. And Jacob, I'm not sure if you or someone else is making that presentation. I'll, I'll, I'll hit it real, to do that. Yeah, I'll hit it real okay, quick. Ron. I think Eileen had asked just to make sure that we sort of touched on this at today's TAC meeting. And so um, I don't think there's a full on, there, there wasn't enough to sort of have an agenda packet, obviously, for this and a separate agenda item but certainly did want to cover it under the other matters because I know uh, people have been waiting and they're anxious. Um, uh, there's probably CDOT staff on the line that can sort of weigh in uh, with additional details, but I'll just say that, you know, we've been working hard with CDOT to um, work towards the final details on getting that uh, funding opportunity out the door. Um, this is one of those issues that got sort of wrapped up in uh, the COVID-19 financial impacts uh, for CDOT and sort of the CDOT uh, funding portion of the Urban Arterials uh, Safety Initiative. Um, now, I think tentatively or finally known as 
safer, safer main streets uh, initiative. Uh, but the commission, the Transportation Commission, needed to take final action um, on the um, CDOT portion of the funding package for the safety initiative, um, and they did that at their previous uh, commission meeting. Uh, I think there's still some opportunity. Mind, we are going to advertise and solicit projects um, and identify priorities for the entire. Uh, 77 million dollars or so that we originally anticipated being available uh, but there's some question about whether we'll actually be able to award all of those funds at the end of the day I think based on the Dr. Cobb board decision and the latest Transportation Commission there's at least 50 million dollars available uh, or so uh, to invest in specific projects and we're, we're I think we're all hoping and uh, working towards uh, getting the full amount available to award for projects. Um, the latest I heard was the actual, the formal announcement of the funding availability option uh, out to potential uh, project sponsors and applicants uh, would happen sometime in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, I don't know, I don't know of a specific date. I'm happy to have the appropriate person from CDOT um, provide any additional details that they have at this point. Okay. Um, Jacob, is there anyone from CDOT that has raised their hand to weigh in on that? Um, yes, Jordan Rudel has from Region okay. 1. Jordan? Hi. <clears throat> Thank you, Ron. Um, you, uh, you provided a really excellent summary there. Um, I don't have a whole lot more to add other than um, we're funneling finally to a level of confidence, as you mentioned you know, within the first week or two of July. Um, some of this I'll just share is we're working on an exciting um, media event, which is obviously a little more difficult to to pull together um, in times of COVID. And um, we'll be working with Dr. Cog to firm up, um, you know, that date for sure. But um, if there aren't any other, um, you know, specific questions, I think that's what we can share right now. We are nearing close to that. And um, hoping, um, as Ron mentioned too, on the funding side, you know, looking right around that 77, 77.5 million up to uh, range of, of projects to select, we have um, probably one or two remaining um, decisions to, to try to finalize with our Transportation Commission on um, Senate Bill funding, specific to some of the transit funding that was going to be part of this multimodal investment opportunity. And um, hopefully that will be moving forward uh, as well. But we are going to start this process and we're really excited to, um, to hear what everybody's ideas and thoughts are for um, making uh, Safer Main Street's initiative successful. Thank you, Jordan. Um, I believe, uh, Mr. Chair, we, yes. Sorry, we do have hands raised. Uh, first from Deborah Basket, and then Art Griffith. Okay, Deborah. Hello, this is Deborah. Um, so I have a question for Jordan. So I'm I'm getting confused if what we were calling urban arterial safety is now folded into safer main streets, and on the safer main streets. I would like clarification uh, of the match for that. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, so, yes, the uh, CDOT has uh, the name for the program will be Safer Main Streets. Um, we had a we had a, a a long name, the Urban Arterial Multimodal Safety Program. Um, that probably was a little bit unwieldy. The, the program intent, purpose, goals, eligible project types, all remains exactly the same. It's just a name change. It's not to be confused with the $4 million of, of state multimodal options fund money that, uh, the, that CDOT announced um, a week or so ago uh, for very small sort of initiatives. This is still very much the urban arterial safety initiative under a different name, um, just as we've just as we've discussed, and the eligibility 
criteria, uh, the evaluation process, everything that's already been approved, that's, that's all remaining the same. So sorry for the confusion with the other initiatives that are sort of coming out of CDOT, but this is the Urban Arterial Safety Initiative. Uh, it's just being called Safer Main Streets. Um, um, uh, I don't know, uh, Jordan, if you had an additional comment on that. Sure. Thank you, Ron and, and Mr. Chair, for just chiming in. I think the other part of um, Barbara's question was regarding um, our match targets. And, and obviously, as we've just had really great um, conversations surrounding toll credits and, and other opportunities, um, we are working to retain flexibility. We, we will be requesting a 20% match. Um, however, for special circumstances and special situations, um, it's, it's the same premise. We, we want the best projects to move forward. And, you know, we want these, these other tools and opportunities to prevail as needed. So we want to be innovative in our thinking and we're open to, um, to dialogue in that regard, you know, in order to pick, pick and get the right projects out the door. Thank you. That answers my questions. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Uh, um, yes, Jacob. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to read um, three questions in the question box from Eileen Yazin. When is the next CDOT Transportation Commission meeting? Will Dr. Cog or CDOT give a heads up notice or just issue a notice of funding opportunity? And one more time, what is the name again, the program? Uh, I will tackle, I, I don't know exactly when the next uh, commission meeting is. I don't have the calendar in front of me. The the name of the program as it will be advertised will be the Safer Main Streets um, initiative or program. Um, Dr. Cog and CDOT will work together to um, promote when the uh, call for projects uh, gets released, the, uh, the notice of the funding opportunity gets released. Again, uh, what we're telling you today is we expect that to happen sometime within the next two weeks um or so and we will broadly broadly and extensively uh broadcast that to all channels that we have available to us to make sure that everyone gets the word that that's out there but you all you all hopefully have been thinking about this the dr cog board approved the dr cog piece and the eligibility criteria uh, a couple of months ago now and so we've that that eligibility criteria hasn't changed what we're looking for hasn't changed at all so go back and and certainly review uh, that information to the extent you need to refresh your refresh your memories on sort of what the intent of the program is because none of that has changed. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Jacob, are, does Art still have his hand up? Yes, he does. And just real quick before we get to Art, David Krutzinger clarified the next CDOT Transportation Commission meeting is July 16th. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, Art? Yeah, thanks. Um, so, the 77.5 million, um, and since it's the same name as the Urban Arterial Safety Initiative, um, then that's where there's about a third of the money that can go um, to like arterials that aren't on CDOT system and two thirds of the money, um, and maybe Jordan can just clarify, Two thirds, or like roughly 50 million, goes to, to improvements on CDOT facilities, and I think that's based on a Senate bill, but I don't remember the name. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Our the you know up to 51 million dollars is uh, state money uh, directed through Senate Bill 267 by the state legislature. That's available only for um, state highway. Um, urban arterials within Dr. Cog Region 1. The other $26 million-ish dollars is a federal surface transportation block grant uh, funds that are available throughout the Dr. Cog Region um, on federal aid eligible um, arterials. Kind of federal aid eligible facilities that meet the criteria of the program. That's kind of how we've assigned it. Thank you, Jordan. Does that answer your question, Art? Yeah, I did. I just wanted to go a little bit deeper on one, but I think 
Is all the money um, then on the 267 for the state money? That way we can use it if we were to go after infra grants and we can use it for a match. So it's non-federal money, the 51 millions. The Senate Bill 267 money is, is state money. It's not federal. Um, I think, I believe that Dr. Cog and CDOT are aligned in the fact that we want to see complete projects funded from this program and not sort of, well, we want, we want an award from this program, but it's contingent on getting another federal grant award that we have to compete for and we might not get. Does that make sense? That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, Jacob, are any other hands up on this item? Um, no other hands up on this item. Um, there is a comment for when we get to other items, but not, not related to the specific item. Okay. Um, I believe Carson will give us a, a AMP working group update. Actually, Mr. Chair, Emily Lindsay will give that update. Okay, great. Well, uh, Emily. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Carson is unable to make it to this meeting, so I'm just taking over for, for the update this month. At the June AMP working group meeting, um, they received an update on the initial progress of the three steering committees tasked with identifying priority tactical action activities within each focus area. Again, those steering committees include focus areas of data and data sharing, shared mobility, and system operations. The working group had a conversation about how to address electrification um, and they kind of came to a consensus that the AMP will coordinate efforts with ongoing electrification efforts around the state rather than reinvent the conversation. So um, that will be addressed through the regular AMP working group activities kind of across all of those different focus areas. They also received an informational briefing about the Colorado Autonomous Mobility Task Force from Ashley Nyland at CDOT. Um, and if you have any questions or you'd like to participate in any way, feel free to reach out to me. I'm Emily Lindsay um, at Dr. Cog. Okay, thank you, Emily. Um, and Jacob, you said we had some comments for other matters. Um, yes, sir. We have a comment from Brian Weimer for other items. Okay. Um, he says, I am hearing that CDOT is changing the 1601 requirements, policy directive 1601, which relates to interchange approvals. What are the changes and is there a public process before the changes go into effect? All right, Jordan, or could you answer that? Um, yeah, I know Tim had to jump off. Um, I know that we've been taking a look at <clears throat> um, a proposal for uh, amendments and changes to 1601. And, and Brian, I don't have the, the follow-up details on where that's at right now to to fully address your questions but maybe that's something that we can we can carry over and get you some feedback on okay thank you um it, ron would that be an item that we might want to bring forward as informational uh briefing at one of our upcoming meetings absolutely mr chair and we just uh we just became aware that there was a a notion of cdot officially um entertaining an uh, amendment to the policy directive 1601. So we've we've put that on sort of an agenda for us to have further conversations with with CDOT about. So as we learn as we learn more, we'll we'll certainly share that with TAC. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other matters or comments to come before the TAC today? If so, please raise your hand or make a comment. I, I uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, this is Ron and uh, I'm, I'm I don't want to short circuit other folks and certainly other people can weigh in, but I want to say that I think Jacob and Jacob and I uh, adequately uh, demonstrated the indispensable indip indispensable um, role that uh, Melinda plays in helping these meetings run much more smoothly than uh, we did. Okay. <laughs> Jacob, were there? Yeah, any Mr. Answers? Chair. Sorry, I am not seeing any other hands raised and I don't see anything else in the question box. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next meeting is July 27th. Um, and with that, we will stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kat.